Now, dear friends, we shall start. This is a huge subject which I have before me this morning. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 22. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. You know, we talk of being weary of this and weary of that. And uh, <laughs> I have yet to hear of people who are getting weary of all the sad and dark, things that people are saying today. See, in a, in a sense, it is sickening. The very atmosphere appears to be sickening. What? No hope. Gloom. Now, here, you know, we are not to be just diagnosticians. Suppose there's a hospital or a group of doctors who say, we only diagnose here. We don't cure anybody. I wonder who will want to go there. So today, everybody has turned into a diagnostician. See, that's wrong, and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and this is wrong. But nobody to suggest the cure. But God says, you have been weary of me. You won't call upon me. In other words, there's no altar in your life. Now, that seems to be the root of the problem. No altar. You know, when the heathen man, Abraham, obeyed the call of God, I wonder what cons concept he had of God. The heathen only seemed to think of God as some terrible being. Powerful, yes, and terrible being. If you turn to the 12th chapter of Genesis, you will find that when Abraham began to obey God, about the first thing that he did was in the 7th verse, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. An altar. He said, I need a place where I meet God. An altar. You know, it's very amazing that in heathen homes, they set aside a, sin, a room where they keep their gods and they call it puja room, prayer room. In heathen homes, you can see it. If you go into a Chinese place of business, you will find a little shrine right in front. They're not ashamed of it. You know, whatever figure they put inside or image, they have a place of prayer, they call it. And when business opens in the morning, 
the first thing they do is offer their prayers or their incense. That's the first thing which they do. You know, one of those great engineers, Sir Arthur Cotton, he, he turned a great river into a source of great blessing for a whole district. A mighty river almost three miles across. When I first drove over that Annie Cut, as it is called, a little strong masonry structure which crossed the river, right across. I said, my, three miles. And he managed just, there was room for me to drive the car just upon that road. And the river was just about a yard away or four feet away from me, held by a little structure. Otherwise, the whole flow of water would have gone into the ocean. By stopping the river, he managed to irrigate, give supply of water to a whole district and it is such a prosperous district, green and beautiful, as far as your eye can see. Yes, and of course it must have, and when he began his work every day, he would go on horseback, and before he got his workers to work, don't forget that was before concrete and that was before cement. It was a masonry structure with which stood a mighty river. He would gather all the crew and pray with them. That was his first act before he got them to work. There were some people who were unashamed of their altar. I do not know how the White House is today. And when they have heathen festivals uh, celebrated like Diwali, which is a purely fictitious, mythological, festival, replete with idolatry. To bring it into the White House is an abomination that the nation must repent of. But, you see, people who are ashamed of prayer, I remember on the turnpike uh, from New York to Philadelphia, I was in a little restaurant. And there, below the glass top, was a, a little statement, a printed note. Don't feel ashamed to bow your head and thank the Lord. For your meal. Yes. There were people who were unashamed. And yet today we almost apologize. If we 
or found a church, or if we have an altar where we pray and where we want to be really private and cut off from the world, people don't understand this. But here, in the eighth verse, so Abraham moved on to the next mountain. And at Bethel, at the eighth verse, and there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And he called upon the name of the Lord. He was not ashamed now. If somebody asked him, hey, what's this that you put up here? It is an altar where I pray, where I call upon the Almighty God, the name of the Lord. So, my dear friends, if you turn to Exodus, Chapter 29 and verse 42. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto you. So, there was to be an altar, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and a continual burnt offering. You see? And the 44th verse, I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. So, God wanted an altar. And the 30th chapter begins with, Thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. You know, friends, a continual burnt offering. There were to be two lamps, one in the morning, one in the evening, to be offered to the Lord. And that was to be a continual process. You know, enjoying prayer. Not as though it is something by rote. You know, some people have say their prayers by rote. And they hardly know what they're saying. And some of them have a system even today. You know, they say their prayers in Syriac, in Latin, and languages that they don't understand. They don't know what they're saying. You know, I was talking to a yoga teacher on the plane. He said he was a yoga teacher. I asked him a question. All right. You say certain prayers and chants. Do you understand them? No, he said. What? You say prayers which you don't understand? Oh, our guru knows it. <laughs> our guru knows it. My dear people, you see... That's what has happened to prayer today. Now, over in Germany, they said to me, you see, 
saying prayers for the dead has got very costly over here. It is cheaper to send those prayers to Spain and Portugal, where it is less expensive to say those masses or those prayers for the dead. I said, has it come to this? It's all to do with money. And you want prayers for the dead to get them out of purgatory into heaven? And uh, so you want it done as cheaply as possible, so you send those prayers over to priests in less expensive Spain. See, folks, we have made a kind of travesty of prayer, a ridiculous imitation of prayer. Did, your, did, did anybody teach you how to talk to your mother? Did anybody tell you how to call your dad, dad? Did somebody teach you how to say mother? Nobody did. It came from your heart. The altar is something which comes from your heart. You want to cry, Abba, Father. <laughs> you are my father. Now, so, the altar abandoned by a people, by a nation. And what is placed instead? Some ceremony, a ceremonial, ritualistic prayers by rote. Now, my dear friends, can you ever displace those little warblings that come from a baby? How precious they are. I used to kind of, you know, before my children became articulate and before they could talk, I would say all kinds of little noises to them, quacko, quacko or something, and they would respond. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a language which they understood before they could speak. Yes, they wanted to communicate. There is in the heart of man the desire and the necessity to communicate with the Heavenly Father and the abandoned, you know, some of our churches look really disused. All through the week they're shut up. Cemeteries may speak of more activity, you see, because somebody is getting buried there. And so they have to keep it open, kind of, for people to come in and go out. But the altars are abandoned. Now, what more do you see? In Genesis chapter 22, you see that marvelous altar, which Abraham built it. You know, that altar that speaks of the cross. Take now your only child, your beloved child, and go to a mountain that I will show you. 
And Abraham obeyed. And offer him there for a second verse as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell you of. You see, God, he loved God more than the gifts of God. You know, we make a very big mistake there. We love him for his gifts. You see, well, I don't give too many gifts to people except when they are in real trouble. But if people say to you, I only love you because of the gifts which you give me. Otherwise, you mean nothing to me. You know, there should come a time of spiritual maturity when we say, hey, gift or no gift, I want the giver. I want the Father of all mercies. I need Jesus. Just to love him because of his many gifts. Yes, we all enjoy many gifts. See, I always feel that I am very ungrateful. I can't help feeling I am, that I am very ungrateful because I have so much to praise him for that I am living at all is his mercy and his gift of life. But suppose I love him just because of his gifts. How poor that relationship would be. Suppose your father became a really poor man. And he became a beggar. And you say, how can I love a beggar? No, he's my dad. He's my dad. Let us pray. <clears throat> Let us tell God, O oh God, let not my altars be broken down. Save me, Father. to make time at the altar, the altar of prayer, the altar of intercession, how much I seem to fail at the altar in intercession, in the shedding of tears for the nations. Oh, my Father, give to us that humility that came to Manasseh, that hard man, bent on his idolatry and indulgence of self. Oh, my Father, that we too may humble ourselves. We pray and ask you, Repair the altar. Lord, let not our altars be desolate. We pray you. We cry to you. Teach us how to make room for the altar. The centrality of the place of prayer. The heart of prayer. The pure conscience with which to lift up holy hands. Please, Father, teach us to pray. Instruct us. Teach us, Father, teach us. If needs be, chastise us and teach us that the altar may never be moved out of its place. 
and the false altars may be thrown out of our city like Manasseh did. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.